So, uh, I am very, very happy to start. And uh, in any case, uh, it's out of question that we would terminate after <laughs> the, the moment which has been uh, said. And uh, uh, I remind all of us that we are supposed to terminate exactly at seven, seven sharp. So uh, usually, of course, uh, these uh, workshops are uh, very active, very vivid. We, uh, uh, the interest of such a workshop is that we can exchange views. It's totally informal, but we have nevertheless, and it's uh, indispensable, a number of introductory remarks. Uh, I uh, have to say just one word, if, if I can, uh, to introduce those who are the introductory remarks uh, speakers. Uh, and um, I uh, will mention Abdulaziz al Gukhair. Forgive me is, <laughs> if it is not uh, well pronounced. Perfect. That's very kind of you. Chairman of the Board of Directors of Mashrek Bank. He is also the chair of the banks in the country. And uh, to that extent, uh, is of course, has a lot of responsibilities which are going even beyond the Mashrek Bank itself. He is also members of the board of directors of Abdullah Al Kohair Group of Companies, which I understand is a very, very important business group in the United Arab Emirates, uh, with a reach on all the Middle East and operation beyond the Middle East in 20 countries. So. Uh, we are all impressed, uh, Your Excellency, by uh, your um, experience and responsibilities. I will go on, if you permit. You will be the first speaker, but I'm going to introduce the other speakers. So we don't have Bertrand Badré because he is in Dubai, and uh, he participated, I understand, in the French Pavilion in, in Dubai, and that's the reason why he could not be uh, with us as uh, foreseen. Uh, we have Raid Sharafeddin, Central and Commercial Banker, former Vice Governor of the Central Bank of Lebanon. So both experience of Central Bank and the experience of a Commercial Banker, and also an international strategist in Central Banking, Regulation, Supervision, Financial Markets, and uh, again, uh, a lot of experience both in the public sector as well as in the private sector. So thank you so much for having accepted to come. I know that you will discreetly <laughs> escape because <laughs> you have to, to, ta to take a flight. Uh, 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 but nevertheless, you will participate. Of course, make the introductory remarks and participate in the first debate. Serge Ecuy, President of the West African Development Bank. Monsieur le Président, c'est un honneur et un plaisir de, de vous accueillir. Uh, you, have, uh, you are President and Chairman of the Board of the West African Development Bank since uh, August uh, 2020. And uh, before, you were, you were yourself also in the private sector with very, very important responsibilities in the UK, in uh, uh, Asia, in Africa, uh, in, uh, and, and you, are, if I may, have uh, gone on all the uh, banking, commercial banking activity that uh, one can imagine. And you've been uh, uh, chief ex executive officer at the Hong Kong-based bank. So all taken into account a unique experience, uh, and uh, we are so happy to have you here, public and private experience. Jean-Claude Meyer, Vice Chairman International of Rothschild, uh, I <laughs> pronounced correctly in English. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, you were, <laughs> it's, it's an old story, but uh, you've been for a while in Lazare, and then uh, you were uh, in Rothschild. Uh, you have been before also in the public sector as an advisor of Datar, an office of the pr French Prime Minister, and you're presently Vice Chairman International of Rothschild uh, and Company, with again, a fantastic experience in investment banking, and uh, uh, I think it, it admirably complements uh, the experience of all the other speakers. And we have Jacques Michel, 
Chairman of BNP Paribas Middle East and Africa for Corporate and in Institutional Banking. You uh, have the, this position uh, in BNP Paribas, uh, and you have yourself uh, a lot of experience. You were CEO and country head of BNP Paribas India, a member of the Executive Committee of BNP Paribas Asia Pacific, and before you were in other bank, commercial bank, particularly uh, yourself also in Hong Kong. I, I can see that Hong Kong, Hong Kong presence is uh, quite impressive around this table. So the idea is, again, to exchange views in the most vivid and, uh, I would say, spontaneous and candid fashion on the issues at stake I uh, seeing, looking at the uh, experience and uh, responsibilities of the speakers, I thought that uh, we could very much concentrate on finance, on uh, f seen from the public and private angle. But of course, I do not exclude at all that uh, uh, if any other of us has a messages to ship on the economy, on the economic problem, and particularly on what's uh, at the border, if I may, of uh, the real economy and, uh, and uh, finance and central banking, uh, including, of course, uh, your appreciation of what's happening as regards uh, inflation, I think it would be uh, very much welcome. So again, feel free to send all the messages that uh, you think appropriate in the circumstances and uh, be as provocative as possible in order for the uh, uh, audience uh, to react. Uh, and I expect the audience to react uh, very, very actively too, because w the benefit of these uh, workshops is really to, to have cross-fertilization between uh, our various, um, again, angles of vision experience. Um, let me only say one word uh, myself. Uh, I, I want to be the moderator and not a speaker amongst the others, but I would like only to suggest a few words precisely on inflation. Uh, clearly, to understand the present situation, we have to see that uh, in many countries, certainly in all advanced economies, the main problem over the last 10 years was inflation much too low, abnormally low inflation. Abnormally no inflation since uh, the last, uh, big, the, the previous big crisis of Lehman Brothers, creating a risk of materialization of deflation in the US, of course, in Japan, in Europe, in all uh, advanced economy, without exception. Even, even Switzerland was in that uh, situation. All advanced economy, very abnormal situation, not, uh, I would say, customary at all, not observed since World War II, apart Japan, again, which was more or less, uh, uh, I would say, in advance, ahead of the curve, if I may, in this uh, respect. So the accommodating policies of all advanced central banks in the advanced economy were due to this uh, abnormal situation. We avoided the deflation in all countries, but we had during 10 years a very, very accommodating policy through all possible means, conventional and non-conventional. Now we see that we are probably getting out of this very abnormal period. And I would say from my own standpoint, it's good. It's exactly what was uh, uh, expected from the policies, macro policies, and certainly monetary policies that were decided upon by the central banks uh, during 10 years. So I do not consider at all that it is a catastrophe that we have inflation. I consider first that it is exactly what uh, the central banks were aiming at. It's positive. That being said, of course, uh, it's only positive if uh, inflation is getting out of too low levels to be re-anchored in the inflation expectations, medium and long term, at the appropriate level and not to, uh, I would say, skyrocket uh, at a very high level, only to create 
ups and downs, ups and downs uh, that are not advisable at all. So, as you know, and I will conclude on that, we have a unique set of definition of price stability or goals as regards inflation. Very often I realize that I'm practically the only one to say that, but all central banks of the advanced economy, Japan, the US, the UK, and the ECB, not to speak of others, have the same definition of price stability, the same goal, 2% in the medium and long run. Uh, the policies have been reviewed in the US, in Europe, and uh, uh, there was no challenge for this arithmetic, if I may, definition of price stability. So that consensus was not decided upon in Basel, in meetings of the central banks. It was a convergence of analysis, but a remarkable convergence because, again, we have a single, I would say, uh, figure that is pronounced by all uh, those uh, advanced central banks. And I mentioned also en passant that uh, the four central banks I have been mentioning are issuing four currencies that are in the basket of currencies of the SDR together with the renminbi. And if uh, uh, the Chinese central banker was around this table, he would probably say 2% is not bad at all. I mean, it's more or less implicitly what we have in mind. So there is a, a very impressive global consensus on trying to anchor as solidly as possible in the medium and long run inflation expectations at that level. But uh, it's easy to say all that, but it's very complicated, of course, to be sure to reach that goal and to reach that stabilization of expectations in the medium and long run. Now, I will stop there and only mention your total liberty in your exposition, again, both in terms of uh, economics, if you have remarks on that, in terms of finance, private, public uh, responsibilities that uh, you have been exerting. And of course, uh, I would turn first to the first speaker. And uh, I already said how deeply you had been involved, and you are involved now, right now, in commercial banking, not only in your bank, but at a, a much larger level. And uh, we would like very much, if you could say, the, the major messages that you have. Uh, you have uh, seven minutes. If you permit me, I will be, try to be strict in order for the exchange of views to be as vivid, as I said, and candid as possible. You have the floor, Your Excellency. Jacques-Claude, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. I'm happy to be here with you. I'm going to talk about our experience here in the UAE. And uh, I'm going to start saying it's really fair to say that, like so many industries across the economy, the financial sector is really being disrupted. I mean, we're seeing a huge disruption here. And it's really the game-changing is the digital innovation and the transformation consumer behavior expectation are affecting the sector the way ahead. So the consumer is really, we used to say a regulator, but now is the consumer is our regulator who's forcing us to change the way we do business. Of course, the pandemic has really further accelerated this, these uh, trends. So it's pushing us uh, um, further, faster. And I will bring this from the UAE perspective. Um, one thing I have learned from the digital revolution is that you never know when the next big thing will come from. And I would like to open by highlighting some themes we are thinking about. First, digital payment. It is a fact that cashless society is upon us, and the coronavirus break has turbocharged the transition. When the UAE government launched the first ever digital payment system, we call it the CLIP, last year, we all, the banks, joined it because of no choice 
thinking this is the way forward the consumer wants. But this means that as banks, we are losing control of our payment system, which has provided us with valuable revenue in the past. But the fintech and the specialized player are increasingly capturing a greater share of this profit. So we are no longer alone in this game, more people coming into our uh, uh, you know, territory. The future for banks that survive will be dominated by platform that cut across industry and platforms. Banks as a service means the financial product will seamlessly be embedded end-to-end -end digital customer journey. This put a new angle on the challenge of securing digital journey and keeping people's money safe from cyber criminals. All these challenges proliferate people's and company revalue the meaning of money, opening the door further for continuing growth on cryptocurrency. The question we must all ask on how broad or narrow money will be in the future. If we look at the blockchain technology, use cases within the financial industry are surging and cryptocurrency continue to gain strength. It is estimated that there are already over 100 million blockchain wallet users worldwide. The combined market capitalization for all the cryptocurrency has already surplus $2 trillion. To understand the scale of the combined value of this company on the Dow Jones industry average is only $10 trillion. So let us recognize that digital money is a serious business. Looking to the future, there are only two scenarios I see. The first is a system that's narrow and closed, in which only central bank money survive, and the other digital currency are confined to the fringes. The other system that broad and open, in which decentralization of money with the prolification of the new digital currency from government and private institution. It is still very early days, and given the degree of uncertainty, it is impossible to predict what will happen to the end game. But regardless, the impact of an open, decentralized financial system could be profound and we must proactively in considering the, the implication. Financial players will need to massively set up their technology, their partners, relationship with developer, and think strategically on how to survive. And we must never forget that the heart of the future of finance is data. And data and AI will grow exponentially. The expectation is that by 2025 only, this will be 20-fold increase. So in no uncertainty, uncertain terms, the message is loud and clear that data becomes the most strategic asset. And that means artificial intelligence will become a core differentiator. With that much data, so much potential for analytics. They are a clear value proposition. Driven by increased revenue through specialization of service and reducing cost through efficiency generated by higher automation, reduced error rates, and a better resource utilization. But also the potential playing a role in avoiding the future financial crisis, flagging event early, and reducing dependency. And this could be true in spotting potential climate change on a global economies. As we are increasingly understand, 
the link between fragility of our planet and economic cost. Data will be key in understanding the link between weather and trade, between climate protest and consumer choice, between ESG rating and the company valuation. Now is the time for the financial industry to truly embrace the change and be bold in doing so, because money and finance tomorrow will look nothing like today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed, Your Excellency. It was uh, very, very stimulating, and I'm sure that you will have a lot of, uh, of questions, uh, particularly on all what you said on the acceleration of the underlying trend and uh, what you said on crypto assets uh, and, uh, uh, and data and AI. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, be prepared to, <laughs> to respond to questions. Uh, I turn now to uh, uh, Raed Sharafeddin. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. While the global health crisis and large-scale lockdowns resulting from COVID-19 is inflicting a huge impact on different levels of the global economy, including risk, risk, risk growth, risk management, inflation, and over-indebtedness, the divergent recovery among advanced, emerging, and developing economies has been a major concern. In addition to the aforementioned risks, inherited Inherent downside financial risks have exacerbated, particularly excessive risk-taking and abnormal asset valuations, vulnerabilities of the non-bank financial intermediaries, financial tensions due to market corrections, crypto asset dis disruptions, and cyber insecurity. Due to the widening gap between economies, improvements in global health and economic indicators might have significant upside risks for global economy and vulnerable developing economies in particular. Lebanon is a developing country that is struggling on diverse fronts, which are general and specific in nature. One is COVID-19 lockdown. Two is the geopolitical tensions, including the Syrian crisis. Three, the liquidity crisis that erupted in the last quarter of 2019 for the government's decision to default on payment of all its outstanding euro bonds in March of 2020. Five, the Beirut port explosion on August 4, 2020, which caused major destruction in the Lebanese capital and led to the resignation of the government. Six, the prevailing energy deficit that is paralyzing dynamic socioeconomic sectors on national scales. Those are to name a few. The Lebanese economy has plunged into a severe contraction across all economic sectors, combined with an unprecedented surge in prices. According to the IMF, the economy has contracted by about, by about 30% since 20, 2017 and is expected to contract further in the remaining 2021 and 2022, while growth contraction has been estimated by Banque du Liban the Central Bank of Lebanon, BDL, at negative 21.5% in 2020. The Lebanese lira has lost approximately 90% of its value and food prices have increased almost tenfold since May of 2019. Unemployment is exceptionally high and over half of the households are below the poverty level. The average inflation rate in 2020 is 85%, whereas the year-on-year -year inflation between July 20 and July 2021 has reached 123%. In the midst of the challenging circumstances that Lebanon is facing, BDL, the Central Bank of Lebanon, has, deployed, has been deploying measures to help the economy survive. And here I'm, work, I'm talking in my capacity as, a, as an observer. I'm not a central bank official. I haven't been an official for the past two and a half years. So as an observer, looking at what the central bank has been doing and assessing the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the measures, I've really counted and uh, put together what the central bank has been doing. 
So these measures, actually, through this, the Banque du Liban has issued a series of circulars that reflects, reflect its management crisis strategy, along with some key economic priorities. Th these initiatives can be divided into three main categories. One, the monetary and exchange rate policies. Two, socioeconomic support. And three, financial sector regulations. The first one is the monetary and exchange rate policies. The, the BDL took measures aiming at facing the challenge of inflation caused by foreign exchange depreciation. They included supporting imported raw and industrial material, and two, prohibiting banks from buying foreign currencies in the parallel markets. As for the socioeconomic support, BDL took measures through many circulars aiming at mitigating the effects of GDP growth deterioration, such as launching the Lebanese Oxygen Fund to support industrial imports, and two, providing banks with foreign currencies to finance the import of basic food items and raw materials necessary for food industry. Another measure was within that, within that context, was confronting the diverse macroeconomic crises that have exacerbated the level of poverty, the economic financial crises, the COVID-19 crisis, and the Port of Beirut uh, explosion. These measures include directing banks to refrain from downgrading the classification of default borrow defaulting borrowers, and compelling banks to provide exceptional loans to individuals and businesses affected by the Beirut port explosion. The third, the third, third element was the financial sector regulations. BDL took measures aiming at strengthening the positions of banks in terms of solvency and capital, capitalization, which in turn contributes to protecting depositors' funds. These measures include actions such as applying a statutory expected credit loss on foreign currency placements, directing banks to refrain from disturbing profits to shareholders, and compelling banks to prepare a plan to conform to the minimum capital requirements. In addition to that, there was a committee that was established to uh, look at and restructure the Lebanese banking sector. My concluding remarks. The initiatives launched by the by BDL, the Central Bank of Lebanon, through its circulars to address the economic financial crisis in Lebanon, need to be combined with a set of key performance indicators to be able to assess their economic, financial, and monetary repercussions and measure their quantitative results along with the ex extent of compliance. Monetary policy measures will remain of limited impact in terms of time frame and macroeconomic factors if they are not accompanied by and integrated with the development of a comprehensive and integrated economic financial plan in the short, medium, and long term. Such a plan would include structural reform measures aiming at first treating the underlying imbalances in public institutions, especially those related to governance, public service, and source of, sources of production. Second, implementing a fiscal strategy that addresses the inherent in inequity in the tax systems and its mechanisms, the deficit in the public finances, the rescheduling, restructuring of the public debt, and the expansion of the social safety net. Third, correcting the shortages in the balance of payments, especially resulting from the deficit in the trade balance, in addition to the weaknesses in the mechanisms of the competitive economy and the integration of the market forces. Fourth and last, pursuing a comprehensive restructuring of the financial sector and establishing a credible exchange rate system. The ultimate objective remains, remains to transfer the Lebanese economy from a rentier state to a productive reality. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed uh, very much. And uh, we, uh, I must say, I'm very impressed by what you said on the drama of the situation which uh, Lebanon has to cope with. And uh, all the elements of a perfect storm are there, I mean, without any exception. And uh, I see also the acceleration of inflation which is quite impressive because you, you said 90%, and if I understand, 123 over the last 12 months. 
which is uh, quite uh, dramatic, totally dramatic. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, 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 certainly. I, I, everybody knows that you have to catch a plane because you have an absolute urgency. They will, they will forgive me, forgive you, certainly. Uh, Serge, uh, Equi, President of the West African Development Bank, you have your seven minutes, uh, cher ami. Sharp. Cher ami. Merci, merci, Monsieur le Président. Um, I'll, I'll briefly describe the, uh, the paradigm, the context in which we are, and uh, conclude with the, uh, with the strategy we are aiming at, which we believe is the way through. Well, since the, the beginning of 2020, we have observed an uh, unprecedented magnitude of, uh, of the economic growth when we compare term on term. Uh, in this context, I have to say that predicting, uh, 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 predicting um, what will the next term economic growth rate be with a high degree of certainty is a highly perilous exercise. However, the following targets uh, seem to be somewhat realistic with 6% for the worldwide economy for 2021 and 4.9, I would say, for 2022. And as, for, as far as West Africa region is concerned, we, our targets are 5.7 and 7.2, possibly, uh, um, uh, for 2022, coming from a very low base, still positive, but uh, the very low base, 0.9% uh, in 2020. These uncertainties are based on the outcome of the COVID-19 pandemic, we all know, with the potential appearance of new variants, notably in emerging countries, but also the slowing down, potential slowing down of the Chinese economy. I won't come back to this with a potential bubble in the real estate uh, sector. That could definitely have impacts on the raw material prices, but also on the oil prices, hitting either uh, the public and private uh, sectors. So as public or private decision makers, we need to be prudent, resilient. And um, because what is really striking here is that this, um, this, this crisis we face is a sanitary crisis uh, with the economic outcome positively correlate, correlated to the level of vaccination. So after Asia in uh, 2020, the U.S. First, first, uh, first half of the year 2021, Europe is now enjoying um, an economic surge with, uh, as its vaccination rate is higher than the one prevailing in the U.S. and anywhere else in the world. Emerging countries and Africa, with a two, between two to four percent vaccination rates, face an additional hurdle with the risk of being marginalized from international trade flows. This could have major consequences on their capacity to have access to new funding sources. This liquidity being so crucial, not only for the necessary expansionary policies, but also to fund the gap of, of, the, uh, the, the, gap of the, uh, the, the, the budget slippage from three to 7%, which is huge for our OMU region. This crisis has occurred all again two years ago and has, is of a financial nature, purely financial nature now. And we have observed the appearance of black swan uh, as described by Nassim Taleb. As you know, stock market has been hit badly in, 20, in March 2020. However, the recovery was swift and when we look at where the, the, the CAC 40 is or the Dow Jones is now, where they are now, it is impressive. So the recovery is swift. So this capacity to recover is swift. So in this context, we have observed the, uh, a, a tremendous increase of the, of the public debt. Tremendous. We're seeing today almost more than 100% of the uh, public debt in an historical low environment. And the worldwide economy has been put 
on a drip. Liquidity was made available. I said yesterday that cash was king. And we believe at the West African Development Bank, and that will be my last remark, Mr. President, that one way through, uh, one way through now is climate and sustainability. The Build Back Better motto should not only be a concept, but a true reality, notably in Africa, where we could even rename it Build Back, or even just build, just build. And the way to build, uh, that's why, uh, in order to, to, to build, that's why we, we definitely support the SDR initiative, because we do believe that through this initiative, uh, this initiative will help the governments to reduce their indebtedness, this is very obvious, but also the private sector to create jobs and sustain growth. So this will be my very last comment, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, and um, I would like to express here uh, my, my, my worries about the, uh, the, the, um, the fact that I just want to believe that the whole world need to understand that build back better should start with the build and need to start from somewhere. That would be all for me. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so much. You, you were very clear on the build. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I turn to uh, Jean-Claude Meyer. You have the floor, and uh, you are very complimentary with all what has been said already. So please, Jean-Claude. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Merci, Jean-Claude. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the future of the financial markets. Uh, three years ago at the WPC in Rabat, I was very pessimistic, maybe too much according to Jean-Claude at that time, uh, as we were at the end of a long 10-year uh, cycle of growth, remembering then the paradox of Minsky, when things seem to go well, it means that crisis is roaring. I anticipate then two scenarios, a soft landing one, which was good, and or a crash in 2020. The crash happened, but for reasons, unfortunately, which I did not expect. Today, in the pandemic context, the situation is, of course, totally different. We are at a crossroad with a lot of uncertainty, <clears throat> but there is a consensus, almost a cliche. The global recovery is on its way, but the moving markets face the risks of inflation and higher interest rates. I must say this year, I follow this cliche with the risk of not being original, but hopefully right. Recovery, as you said, Serge, is on its way, if we are not, if, even if we're not yet out of the woods. World growth should be of 6% this year, roughly in the world, in Europe, 4.3%, in the US, 6.2%, and in the world, 4.5% next year, which is extraordinary. This recovery has been fueled by social measures of the governments and the huge flows of liquidities of all central banks. And we fear now a tapering, which could lead to a rise of interest rates. In the US, Jay Powell has just succeeded to announce a later gradual tapering in November, maybe, or in December, until 2023, without provoking a panic market as it was the case in 2013. The Fed will continue to maintain its monthly $100 billion asset program until the US reaches to a 2% inflation and maximum employment, emphasizing that tapering would not lead automatically to rising to raising interest rates. In Europe, ECB said it would slowly but uh, buy fewer bonds in the future and move to a moderately lower pace in its 80 billion a month emerging. Uh, uh, pandemic emergency, emergency Purchase Program, PEPP, 
the lead is in tapering, said Christine Lagarde, until probably March next year. Overeating and inflation are threatening. As the Fed has shifted its stance to give more leeway to inflation and greater priority to employment. A risk of overeating, yes, but which can be transitory, according to Jay Powell. The risk. Inflation has reached, as we all know, 5% in the US and 3% in Europe, and risks are there for various reasons. First, wages could increase because of a long boom of a Chinese workforce now being aging. Second, oil and natural gas prices are up, maybe for a long time. Third, a large overrank of private savings is waiting to be spent. Fourth, near zero interest rates feed a bubble of the stock market's exceptional monetary growth, huge fiscal deficits. Fifth, population is getting older with consumers, baby boomers, increasing demand and less productive labor force. Six, we must point out that the Central Bank of Norway has just increased by 0.25% its rates projecting a 1.5% interest rate in the next year. This gives a trend and a turn maybe, alongside with Norway, followed by Pakistan, Hungary, Brazil, and Paraguay. US Treasury bonds last week has just gone from 1.3% to 1.5%. But inflation could be indeed transitory. Only 235,000 jobs were created in the US in August versus 750,000 expected uh, with a still a nearly 6 million unemployed people. And, and wages have increased by 4.3% less than inflation. And inflation in August in the US has been limited to 0.3%. But if unemployment falls, wages will increase. Consumption as well, leading to inflation, raise of interest rates, and a shock on the market, of course. Transitory also, because automation could replace partially the Chinese labor force. The present inflation is driven not by tightening demand, but by a shutdown of offer, as we all know, particularly of goods having run into temporary bottlenecks, as in logistics, timber, semiconductors, etc., and by a rise of uh, raw materials. Fortunately, if we can say so, Delta is slowing the recovery and might favor a more cautious attitude from the Fed. If this transit transitory inflation remains controlled, interest rates will remain low, maybe for the next 10 years, according to Olivier Blanchard, and thus stock markets could remain healthy. Inflation wearing in June is not so important if compared to a year before, which was depressed because of a crisis and is just rising because the economy is emerging from the deep freeze. I personally totally disagree with Larry Summers, who believes that we live in a recipe for disaster, leading to hyperinflation. And I disagree also with Noriel Rubini, who anticipates a stagflation. No hyperinflation, no stagflation. Financial markets, as we all know, are a consequence of growth inflation, employment level, and interest rates, which have led to a certain bubble of assets, shares, real estate, art, but could make us rather optimistic. A certain bubble, yes. Indeed, global equities are now at very high valuations according to the Schiller cyclically adjusted ratio of price earnings. American stocks are valued at a multiple of 22 
versus European stocks at 17, this important decoupling might shrink in the future to the advantage of European stocks. Several fund managers fear the stocks are running too hot and that we are at the top of a bubble. In fact, there is no doubt a certain bubble as S&P 500 is 3%, 30% above the level of February 2020 and NASDAQ 50% above. All depends on prospects for corporate earnings for inflation and interest rates. If corporate profits remain strong and interest rates low, stock prices look reasonable. The big question is whether interest rates will jump, how soon and how much. Stocks, as we know, are sensitive to the level of bond yields, with low yields making, of course, equities more attractive and the only investment. For the time being, there is no alternative, TNA. But risks are still there. A new wave of the virus, high volatility of the market, leading to a possible overreaction. A financial crisis in China, already 1 trillion and 700 have been wiped off uh, recently in the Chinese stock market, particularly in the internet and the real estate sector. A war on the Chinese waters because of Taiwan and other geopolitical risks. A collapse of some shares due to environmental concerns. A split of the US internet companies due to interest measures. A crisis on some sovereign debts if interest rates rise a lot. But I am rather confident on the stock markets for the following reasons. Above all, as higher interest rates should regularly but slowly increase in the future in a moderate way. As buybacks are increasing now, $500 billion expected during the second half of this year favoring shareholders over debt holders. As mergers and acquisitions are booming thanks to cheap long-term financing. And as the level of employment is still lower than before the crisis. And as we know, for the time being at least, as investors buy the dip. To conclude, thanks to a robust growth, moderate inflation, and interest rates rising slowly, and thanks to a continuous good fine-tuning of, of the central banks, I expect no boom nor a crash, bumpy markets with ups and downs every day, as it, as it is the case, as it was the case this week, which was not good. In brief, next year, a slow increase of the markets of plateauing gently, but we are at the crossroad and we should remain careful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jean-Claude. Uh, <laughs> I said uh, the complementary uh, expositions uh, are so useful for all of us. So, uh, but I found, as you said, that you are much more optimistic. <laughs> optimistic, maybe reasonable. No, of course, remaining reasonable and calling for vigilance in any case. But, uh, but very interesting and stimulating. Jacques Michel, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So indeed, I will take uh, another angle to complement what uh, has been said before. Uh, as a practitioner on the ground, um, I will draw the first lessons of this pandemic, even though uh, this uh, unprecedented and disruptive period is not over. And also, um, I will make a focus on the Gulf economies, and we have been in Abu Dhabi for two, two, uh, two days, and I believe for the participants it will be of interest to uh, uh, give some highlights about the, under the control of Abdelaziz, uh, the, the, the main trends uh, related to the Gulf economies. First of all, uh, as mentioned and underscored by Abdelaziz, uh, the pandemic has been a catalyst in many fields, okay, an accelerator. And uh, internally, indeed, we intensify digitization, we intensify automation, industrialization of processes, new ways of working. And for corporate investment banking platform, it's not easy. 
to ask a trader or a fixed income sales to work from home requires security protocols, a lot of IT support. So we have been agile, anticipatory, we have been resilient. So uh, on the CIB segment and as a whole, uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, BNP Paribas, like many other global banks, uh, perform well, whether pretty well the, the, the storm. Uh, we exercise our social and civil responsibility by supporting the real economy, uh, uh, adhering to some programs put in place by the policy makers. Uh, but also uh, we exercise diligence, uh, selectiveness, uh, strong uh, uh, discipline at origination, um, anticipation, portfolio management. So we could, in short, weather the crisis so far uh, well. And we uh, accelerated some changes uh, internally, notably uh, digitalizations. As far as the Gulf economies are concerned, um, of course, it has been disruptive. SME segment, uh, individual uh, uh, have been much impacted, but overall, the combination of massive support packages in the region, okay, with um, very low, extremely low interest rate and markets flush with liquidity, uh, made, uh, 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 I would say, possible um, uh, financial stability uh, across the board in the Gulf countries. And some of them uh, took uh, the opportunity to pursue some uh, structural uh, reform, uh, tax uh, reform. I would like, uh, and bon, despite all these uh, support measures, uh, as uh, you know, uh, the Gulf countries in 2020 um, were in reception and the recession and the GDP contact, contracted by 5.3% in average. I would like to highlight also um, the amount of debt raised by, uh, by the Gulf countries, which is something new. In fact, uh, we are in a new paradigm since 2015, when the oil, pi oil prices dropped by uh, more than 50%, and uh, the Gulf countries came to the loan and the bond market. And we'll focus on the bond market. During, between 15 and today, uh, the Gulf countries, the six JCC countries, raise uh, $390 billion debt on the bond market, okay? 2020 has been a recorded year with $107 billion bonds. Year to date, $77 billion bond for the six GCC countries. So which make within the emerging market space, the GCC has the most vibrant uh, segment uh, and due to massive liquidity, uh, all the transactions, mainly for the sovereign, but this year in 21, for the first time, for the large GREs and large uh, corporates, all these transactions have been massively oversubscribed with no, whatever the underlying asset, whatever the rating of the sovereign, investment grade or non investment grade, no pricing differentiation. And I'm afraid that the party might be over soon. This will be my first message. Uh, so far, the Gulf countries have benefited from a very, very conducive environment and could tap successfully uh, uh, the bond market and borrow money, of course, at a very low uh, cost of uh, funding. And another characteristic still under control, uh, indebtedness, uh, debt to GDP increase. Uh, in the case of uh, Saudi Arabia, it uh, started from nil in 14 to 31% today of GDP, and the weaker economy, Oman and uh, Bahrain, we are uh, above uh, 75 or 100% uh, debt compared to GDP. So there is this new trend which has been uh, amplified by the uh, pandemic, since uh, definitely the, the countries had to uh, finance uh, their COVID relief packages 
uh, établi and their capex. So, uh, what are the prospects and the, the challenges ahead? Um, all markets uh, constitute the main uncertainty, and uh, these economies have been very dependent on and still dependent on the oil market, even though. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the uh, estimates for 21 are quite positive uh, at 75 and above. Um, the observers and the experts anticip for, uh, anticipate for 2022 uh, uh, a decline in uh, the, 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 the oil, oil market. So I would say um, uh, the rebound uh, in the DC country will be of limited amplitude. For 2022, uh, the rebound, the economic growth, in average, is, has been estimated to 2%, 2.2% only. Okay, it will take time before uh, the market sentiment and the businesses come back to to normal. But I would say there is a new paradigm, a new normal appearing, new priorities, and uh, definitely energy transition and ESG requirements are becoming top priorities across the board among the sovereign, the sovereign funds, uh, the large corporates, and um, market perception might change rapidly, um, and notably vis-à-vis -vis, uh, uh, hydrocarbon intensive economies. They have a, a long way to go. Uh, policy makers, uh, stakeholders are very much aware that it is of critical importance uh, that uh, they have to put in place robust uh, uh, ESG uh, frameworks. Uh, but uh, uh, many banks sign the Net Zero Banking Alliance, and so they will have. Uh, to reduce progressively their exposure on the oil and gas sector. Okay, so I would say um, access to uh, uh, the loan or, or the bond market might be more difficult. Uh, investors might be more selective, more choosy. Um, blenders will try to identify the winners of tomorrow and to phase out their exposure from what they consider the losers of tomorrow in that respect, in, in terms of uh, energy uh, transition. So I would say um, a sensitive uh, uh, period, um, new priorities, a new normal is appearing, and um, for the weakest economies, uh, non-investment grade, we might be faced one day to a kind of liquidity squeeze or credit uh, crunch. So, um, major challenge ahead. Um, but what is positive, uh, all these countries are very much aware of this uh, new paradigm and the uh, new constraints related to uh, energy transition. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jacques. That was very, very interesting also, and I, I could say that uh, you identify a number of issues that are, of course, of uh, uh, great importance, and I could see the body language of Abdulaziz <laughs> from time to time. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> a lot of issues uh, which were addressed. Normally, it is the moment where a lot of questions are asked, not only questions, but statements, if I may. Uh, and I could also see a lot of body languages coming from the audience. I would recommend to be, uh, you to be as uh, clear as possible in your exposition. We have a rapporteur, and uh, we have to facilitate uh, its, uh, his task. Uh, uh, let me only say from my own standpoint that we have a big, big issue, which is monetary policies of central banks, all central banks of the world, and whether or not we consider that we are in a relatively safe side, as uh, uh, Jean-Claude said, or whether it might be a little bit more complex and uh, whether uh, it is, as you said, uh, uh, 
maybe uh, Larry uh, Summers or, uh, or Blanchard, uh, who's right. Or, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it is, uh, of course, the jury is still, still open there, but we, we could discuss that. We have the issue of cryptocurrencies and the digitalization of uh, the, all the world, of the real economy and of finance, uh, which uh, you address, Abdulaziz, very, very clearly at the very start, and which is an immense issue, and I expect that some of us will uh, intervene. Uh, I, I would myself, under your control, Abdulaziz, say that I would make the difference between the real cryptocurrencies, that are real currencies, if I may, and the crypto assets that seems to me very much, uh, uh, I would say, speculative assets, uh, respectable speculative assets, but not uh, able to be real currencies because I am still of the old school of uh, Aristotle, if I may, considering that a currency must be simultaneously a good, store, uh, a good uh, uh, unit of account, a good... Uh, mean of exchange and a good store of value. And when I see the Bitcoin going up and down, up and down, up and down, it seems to me that it is lacking the good store of value qualification uh, which uh, makes a currency, if I may. But we have a lot of other issues. What I would recommend perhaps for the statements to be made would be perhaps to say, well, we have positives and we have negatives in my view. Uh, in order for, uh, for the, the communication to be uh, as, uh, as uh, easy to understand as possible. Because we are in situation, in all dimensions of the situation, which uh, comprehends uh, positives and negatives, of course. So who would first ask for the floor? Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jean-Claude, and uh, thank you all for those very informative and uh, insightful presentations. You know, I spent a lot of my life in the International Monetary Fund, so it's hard to shake the habit of looking for risks. And uh, I thought I might just share what I think are perhaps three, three or four risks that we could look at for next year. The first is that <clears throat> it's absolutely right, as, as Jean-Claude and others said, you know, uh, you said at the beginning in opening, Jean Claude, that uh, there is a. The numbers look good in the aggregate. You know, growth numbers look pretty good. But if you disaggregate, you find that there is a very strong, and, and I think some people have called it a dangerous divergence that's happening. So the numbers for Sub Saharan Africa for this year, for next year, are about between three and three and a half percent, <clears throat> which is pretty low for given population growth on average. The numbers for Latin America and South America are very poor. And what is more worrying is that if you look at the numbers, not just for this year and next year, but for the next five years, they have been brought down quite sharply in many emerging markets. So really what has happened is that as a result of each crisis, 2009 crisis, this crisis, the long-term growth rate is brought down in emerging markets. And that's a dangerous uh, long-term prognostic because convergence you know, is, is becoming harder for a lot of those countries. So that, that I think is something we just need to bear in mind as we look at the next year. In, and the second risk I wanted to mention is that this year we have not seen the debt problems manifesting themselves in, in the kind of debt restructuring or debt defaults that some people feared at the beginning of the year. I think a year ago there was a bit more worry that we would see a few more accidents than we have. Next year we might be surprised the other way because interest rates are going to go up a little bit. Corporate debt is very high in, in some emerging markets. It's built up to levels that would be hard to sustain. Um, a few low-income countries, maybe half a dozen, have debt levels that would be very hard to sustain. And we don't yet have a very good framework 
for dealing with that. You saw the G30 report that came out, uh, other reports have come out. So I think we need to be aware that during 2022, we may have more difficult issues dealing with the emerging market and low-income country debt than we have seen uh, this year. So that's the second one. The third one I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, is a question of managing expectations. And I want to say the two, two ways in which I see the risk. One, SDRs. So everybody very happy, 650 billion, it's a big number. Um, you know, the initial allocation was important for many emerging markets and gives them breathing time to, to use that because next year will be a difficult year for many of them. Uh, but if you look at the numbers now, there is a big discussion, say if you take Africa, you know, Africa got 25 billion of the ori ori original allocation. Low-income countries got, I think, 5 billion uh, of the, uh, in Africa. So. If you take, as I think of Sub-Saharan Africa, if you think of uh, the various proposals now of reallocating, let's take some of the SDRs that went to the countries that don't need it, let's move it. At the end of the day, the two ideas that are going to get approved, in my view, in the next couple of uh, months, will basically take about 70 or 80 billion dollars worth of SDRs and transfer them from national central banks to a holding account in the IMF. That's all that's going to happen. And then that money will be dispersed over five years, slowly, along with fund programs, subject to policies, subject to debt limits. But the expectation is for much larger and more immediate reallocation. So we have to manage that expectation. And the other expectation, that's my last point, that it's worth managing, is that, you know, when we fell into COVID, everybody fell together into a deep black hole. Within two weeks, the whole world went from doing what it was doing to sort of at the bottom of the pit. And awful, you know. But their small consolation was that everybody was in that space at the same time. And people were struggling to find a solution to it. Now we have the vaccine. But we are coming out of the hole at very different pace. Rich country is pretty much out of the hole now. We are all talking about the post-COVID world. Other countries are coming a little bit behind, but some will take two years before they get vaccinated. And the tolerance of populations who are at the bottom is going to be much less when on their phones, they can see every day how those that have got out are now enjoying themselves and living a normal life, but they are still stuck. And they have to blame people. So the first group they hold responsible is their own governments. And we have already seen an erosion of trust between governments and people. It's already quite low. Riyadh has, has, has gone. But in Lebanon is just one example. You, I can give you half a dozen examples where we have had social explosions, not caused by COVID, but exacerbated by the frustration of populations after living a year in this. And that frustration will only become more acute when they see others doing better. So I guess my, my, my last point was that I, want, I think it's important that we also recognize that the management of the social political expectations will become a source of uncertainty, which will then impact markets, because you will see that many countries or some countries will not be able to contain the, the frustrations of their population in during the coming year. So I just wanted to put some of those risks on the table uh, that's, as well. That's very, very useful. Uh, you're absolutely right, of course, uh, as you said. You have such an experience in the IFIs. Uh, clearly, uh, if I uh, memorize the last uh, uh, messages of the IMF, this divide between advanced economy and the emerging one and the lower middle income is absolutely striking. The, rev the reviewing 
of projections was done up for the advanced economy and down for uh, these other economies. So the divide in the world is uh, is alarming, that's clear. And I have to say, but it's a question for, uh, for the audience, I am absolutely struck by the difference of vaccination between, between say, sub-Saharan Africa, to oversimplify, and Europe. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And I am struck by the fact that I, I don't see yet, and fortunately, highly fortunately, I hope that there are good reasons for sub-Saharan Africa to resist the attack of the virus, but, but I mean, the, the dangers and the risks seems enormous. Other Intervention, please. Thank you. Um, I would like to, to second very much what uh, Masoud just said and uh, argue that uh, when you looked at the current situation, you didn't comment on long-term growth prospects. And I wonder whether one could say today that growth prospects after COVID are better than what they were before. And I'm talking about potential growth. And before COVID, we were actually considering that there were risks on the evolution of potential growth. There were discussions about the trend of productivity that were not very encouraging. There had been uh, some coming back in the United States, but still quite timid. So there were questions raised about the future of potential growth. And I don't see how the COVID crisis could actually make us more optimistic about that. So I think one of the long-term risks is indeed what potential will do. There, there may be one reason to be optimistic, which is exactly what uh, Serge said earlier, which is if we shift our view towards sustainability, because there we have a lot of needs of investment, uh, both to mitigate climate change, to adapt to climate change, and to actually provide protection of biodiversity and, and, and so on. So that leads me to the second comment, which is about debt. My own view is that we shouldn't be worried about debt if public spending were well used. And that's a big question. Are we confident today that the kind of uh, ease that uh, fiscal policy gave us, which was very needed in the short term, does it bear long-term risks? And I would say it does, except if that spending was well used. And one way to look at it would be, does it, does it make the transition towards sustainability easier? And I'm not sure. I think it's a, it's a question. But I think we should look at that. I, I'm optimistic about public debt because I think that public debt uses the extra savings that if there were no public debt uh, uh, issues, these savings would be used in speculative instruments. So in a way, the fact that uh, there has been a rising public debt has been a factor of stability for financial markets. So that, but then, of course, uh, the risk is whether this money uh, was better used by the government than it would have been by the private investors in speculative uh, items. On speculation, I, I would like to, to rejoin to join, uh, what, what the chairman said about uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, um, I, I, found, I, I even found you optimistic when you said that there are cryptocurrencies. Uh, I see crypto assets. Uh, and I think that most of them are highly speculative, and this is no money. And I would add to this three dimension of money, uh, what unifies the three of them is trust. And I don't see, I, I mean, we are in societies where trust needs to be based on something. I, a decentralized trust is speculative. So that's something that is very difficult to, uh, uh, to, 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 to maintain. Um, my final uh, comment is a question uh, um, because we have not discussed green finance. And I think that when we look at the financial systems, uh, it probably will be a very important dimension. It is right now uh, the fastest growing segment of financial markets. It's very small. But it seems to me that green finance is a link between what we need in terms of long-term growth prospects, what we need in terms of sustainable uh, development, uh, and what we need to bridge the gap that uh, Masoud uh, commented on between social expectations and economic expectations. So uh, do we believe in green finance and what is needed to, to, to increase the confidence in that movement? 
Thank you very much indeed. The idea that ESG was very, very important was mentioned. Uh, we, we, of course, are, are badly missing Bertrand Badré because he is the specialist in, the, in the, this uh, panel of, uh, of green finance and unfortunately he could be, couldn't be there, as I said. Thank you very much for, for your remark. I have myself some remarks on your, on many remarks, but I keep it now because I think we have to multiply the intervention. Madam. Do I need the microphone? Uh, I'm, I'm a bit intrigued with the issue of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. I'm not a specialist, but it's a new, um, following the Second World War, John Maynard Keynes, uh, you know, suggested that there will be one currency in the world. And he said, if there is one currency, there will be more equality between nations than no nation would dominate or would be a hegemon on, you know, on the global economic market. And we know after First World War, um, the U.S. took all the gold in the world. It had like two-thirds of the gold reserves in the, in the world. The Bretton Woods decided that the currency, no, each country currency is dependent on a certain gold reserve because gold is a scarce uh, commodity. Hello. What happened is the U.S. started, you know, uh, especially with Johnson, um, uh, Johnson um, administration, they started spending, spending, spending. They could no longer link it to the gold, so uh, they, they, it, it was no longer linked to the gold. So Bretton Woods was like dead. And then we had the fiat money, which is the currency based on supply and demand, like any commodity, and. Uh, also with the U.S., with its uh, race with the Soviet Union, starting spending more and more, especially with the arm race with the Soviet Union. And as we see, the, the, the gap between nation is getting more and more. And, and in, each, between, in each nation, the gap between the poor and the rich is getting more because inflation touches the middle class mainly. Because if you have an asset, the asset grows in, in, in value. But if you live from paycheck to paycheck, your paycheck will be, will be worth much less with inflation. Hala, I'm not sure, but what I'm saying, what they, the whole concept of cryptocurrency, that it's decentralized, uh, there is also the concept of scarcity. Do you think like one time, if the cryptocurrency replaces central banks, and it will be one currency in the world, like we won't use any more dollars or dirham or, or euros, and everyone uses cryptocurrency, there will be more equality between nations, and also there will be no more inflation, like you'll have a stable value of the currency. <laughs> will that be possible? I don't know. I'm asking no, you. No, it's so. a good question. It's a good question. We could, of course, spend... Uh, two hours now, uh, because it's a very, very important issue. Uh, in each central bank, you have a member of the highest level of management, which is reflecting on the next cryptocurrency that would be issued by the central bank. So uh, we, 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 in Basel, you have Benoit Curé, specializing in uh, optimizing the, the situation from the standpoint of the sanctuary of central banks. And you have the private sector imagining cryptocurrencies. I would dare say that theoretically they are really currencies because they would be based upon a basket of currency. And so the, the value would be, uh, I would say, uh, sure than what we have if the, if with the Ethereum, uh, the, the Bitcoin and the like, which are not at all currencies. The currency is a, a, a joke. Uh, they are crypto assets. And, uh, of course, you have assets that are purely speculative. They found uh, some instruments that are purely speculative. Now, I would say it's a dream to imagine that a cryptocurrency could be the global currency. I don't trust that for, uh, for a minute. Uh, I think that uh, it is very important that somebody is responsible for the currency. And we, until we found out a better institution, central banks are there. They are there to take care of the value of the currency, of the trust in the currency, the confidence in the currency. And after all, they are doing that not too poorly, if I may, when I look at what has happened. You mentioned inflation, but the problem of the, at least the advanced economy, was that inflation was not sufficient. It was not at 2%, which is considered right or wrong to be a, some kind of optimum. 
they were too low, and the materialization of a deflationary risk was there. That's the reason why they were so accommodating, and their policy were so accommodating, which has, of course, a lot of uh, uh, unfortunate byproduct also. Of, uh, the, all this is quite complex. But what I would suggest is to have an, another look at the situation. When central banks are committing themselves in the medium and long run to say we are anchoring inflation expectations on 2%, and as I said, it's the case for a number of major central banks, it is the equivalent of, something, of an anchor. The anchor is the arithmetic anchor, 2%. And uh, if a, a central bank loses totally its, uh, its uh, uh, anchoring goal, then it, look, it, it, it loses its credibility, and uh, that, that is very grave, I have to say. So I prefer, to be frank, uh, a planet where you have a number of central banks saying, I will deliver to my own fellow citizens something like 2% per, per year over a long period of time. I prefer that to a gold uh, anchor that would be totally erratic also and uh, could uh, drive us to abnormal situation. And certainly it is much better than some kind of crypto instruments that nobody is caring for. Uh, so I stop there because, as, as I said, we could, we could discuss that for a very, very long uh, period of time, but I reserve the right to discuss with you in the corridor, and I, I think that many of us would like to do that, including our rapporteur. Uh, please, madame. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the um, uh, interesting presentations. I'm not a money or finance specialist, so I'm learning... Uh, Quite a lot. I, I work at IFRI on technology, so I was interested uh, to hear about crypto and Bitcoin, but I would like to know as well, uh, um, you know, from your various experiences, how you approach the uh, quantum revolution um, as quantum computers will probably, supposedly, um, uh, thanks to their um, computation, uh, computing capacities, um, and especially be useful for factorization and pose serious cybersecurity threats uh, in terms of um, uh, current uh, encryption mechanisms. And so I was wondering how that's uh, taken into account in your various institutions, and as well as the uses maybe of quantum computers for um, financial optimization. So that's general question about quantum tech in your various capacities. <laughs> A very good question indeed. Uh, I have to say that Scientific American has an article on uh, your, to try to elaborate on your question every month, if I'm not misled. Uh, who wants to take the floor to elaborate on quantum computing and the last uh, very, very important uh, breakthrough in this domain? Jean-Claude, no? <laughs> I think that it was a very good question, and we are all meditating on the appropriate response. No, we have a response there. Uh, speak up. Yeah, I'm, I'm a medical doctor, but I happen also to be a mathematician. I'm by no means a specialist of number theory and quantum stuffs. But what I can say is that there are threats from a cybersecurity point of view. However, there is a deep, deep mathematical result uh, about the fact that P uh, is not equal to NP. I won't go into the detail on this Kabbalistic way of thinking of mathematician, but it means that uh, uh, this is a conjecture. It's not really uh, settled today, but a large, large part, like 99% of uh, the specialists think that P is not equal to NP, which means in our daily world that there should not be a break uh, of cryptography security, meaning that we can settle, uh, even with computing uh, power, uh, some uh, cryptographic system that can't be broken by quantum computers, which is something like quite relieving, I think. Thank you very much indeed. It is half reassuring. 
<laughs> because if it had been demonstrated, as you know, the guy would get a billion dollar, if I'm not misled, no? So uh, it's, it's not yet <laughs> sold. <laughs> so the billion dollar offered by a foundation is not that. It's one of the seven very important mathematical problems that are unsolved. And one of them, one of the seven has been solved. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So but, thank you very uh, much, madam. Maybe briefly, uh, please, if you don't mind, on please. quantum. Uh, <coughs> so uh, it is expected that quantum computing would be more largely available in five to 10 years. So today you have post-quantum cryptography because what you need is to protect the data that uh, you store and that might be exploited later. We know that China is hacking uh, data that are encrypted because they expect to be able to decrypt this data uh, more rapidly than others. Uh, you have big progress in quantum communication, quantum censoring, and quantum computing. Today, uh, you have quantum as a service. So on some financial institution, chemical uh, uh, industries are using this. It's quite cumbersome. You must prepare your calculation quite in advance. You, go, you run extremely fast. Uh, and you see big progress notably from Australia, in quantum sensoring that will provide the stability because you have a problem of stability in your quantum computers. So it's not such a theoretical issue. That's the only point I wanted to mention. Very inspiring. And so uh, I must confess I, am, I had uh, some uh, mathematical education too. I remain a little bit skeptical uh, after having read a, a lot of articles on really the possibility of uh, of making absolutely fantastic breakthrough, but, but we will see. And in any case, uh, we know so little things on quantum mechanics itself, on, uh, I would say, the way the world functions and the nature uh, with all the, her, her mysteries function. So uh, we, we have to, to be prepared for any kind of new scientific uh, discoveries. And, but thank you very much for your question. Other intervention, please, you have the floor. My name is uh, Gilles Guérin, I'm a private banker and I deal with high net worth individuals and on top of that I'm the treasurer of this World Policy Conference. Uh, we're facing at the moment in China a very big default. I mean it's already called the Lehman Brothers of China for $300 billion with Evergrande and the only solution seen at the moment is a 75% haircut. So don't you think that will affect the trust of the investors in emerging markets regarding the bond, the next bond issue, and they will look twice before investing in, despite the, the interest rate and the tenor? Very good question again for all of us, uh, not especially the speakers, but all, all of us. My, my own sentiment uh, in one minute is that uh, uh, there are a lot of problems in the, the domestic uh, economy in China, a lot of uh, abnormal level of debts in many, many entities, uh, private and public entities, uh, local authorities and so forth. It's a problem which is very well documented since quite a long period of time, calls for uh, restructuring, reshaping, and we will see what happens uh, for this problem, which is really a big one and perfectly accepted by the Chinese uh, uh, authorities, if I may, as one of the, their major problems. Now, this is a particular point. I, I have a tendency to exclude a new Lehman Brothers because we had the experience of Lehman Brothers. I had myself the experience of Lehman Brothers. I remember talking to the Secretary of Treasury and to to my colleague in the US, and at the very moment they were hesitating. Uh, uh, they had no private solution, so they didn't want to embark on a public solution, and they were clearly not in the central bank, but in the treasury, under-assessing the immense consequences of uh, the uh, collapse. I don't suggest that they should have avoided the collapse. I'm, uh, I hesitate to say that because uh, I would say more generally the public opinion in, in the U.S. was not ready for a big uh, public money investment to avoid the catastrophe. So it was very complex economically, financially, and politically. All that being said, 
the experience is there, so I cannot help thinking that the authorities in China will understand that they have to, uh, I would say, manage the situation and not let the thing go, uh, lay man bother like. But we will see, of course. And you're absolutely right to uh, ask the question. Uh, in any way, we, we have to be fully aware of the risks that are at stake. Mazoud was very clear on that. We have assets and liabilities in the present situation. We have positives and negatives, and we must be as exhaustive as possible if we want to be, to be, to be fair. Uh, and we have th still uh, 30 minutes, but uh, no more than 30 minutes. Uh, we have to be, to be concise. If I may, I take advantage of the fact that I, I don't want uh, anybody to ask for the floor at this stage. And under the control of the speakers, uh, on crypto, we, we said, we mentioned, I think, uh, quite a lot. Uh, but again, all central banks are reflecting on their own crypto currency issuing. And uh, it is for the, for the commercial banks very, very important because if you have the central bank giving you an account in crypto uh, currency, then what about the deposit in the commercial banks? So it totally changed the business model of the commercial banks. So it has to be looked after very, very, very carefully by, by the central bank. It is what they are doing, by the way. They don't want to destroy the banking system. But they, they cannot let uh, blockchain and all the technology that Abdulaziz has, has mentioned only in the hands of those that are uh, uh, inventor uh, of, uh, of crypto, uh, uh, I would say, uh, assets uh, that are uh, purely that are largely speculative. Uh, uh, another word, perhaps, on ESG, because I, we had no time to address it too much. This is very important. There is a, an immense problem at the global level. Whether or not we will have, as regards the new non-financing reporting on climate and on S and G, uh, some kind of core of regulations, uh, standards at the global level. As you know, there are a lot of meditation on that. G7 has been on that. The uh, G20, the IFRS, are reflecting on the setting up of a new board that would be specialized at a global level in this kind of standards. Uh, I expect that the decision could be taken quite rapidly now uh, in the occasion of uh, the next uh, COVID, uh, uh, meet, not COVID, uh, uh, the, the next uh, green meeting at the global level. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we will see exactly, but, but this is a very important issue. And of course, the way investors will take into account ESG, the green uh, finance, which can grow very rapidly, but also the greenwashing, which uh, has been uh, more or less uh, underlined uh, is, as a problem, and the green bubble and so forth. I mean, we have an immense domain there to reflect upon. Uh, I think that we, what we said on potential growth, if I may, my own reflection would be uh, productivity progress had a very, very important slowing down, more or less, in 2006, 2007. It was before, in a way, before the, the subprime, before the, the last, uh, the, the former crisis of uh, Lehman Brothers. And we are in that situation since then, with some signs that we are getting out. We were getting out immediately before COVID. I hope very much that uh, we, will, we are getting out. Uh, some were arguing that we were experiencing the famous solo paradox, namely that there were a lot of investment in digitalization, but no results in terms of uh, productivity growth. I trust that it is likely that we have a phenomenon of that kind. It was very abnormal to see at the moment where there was a technology, technological surge that uh, all uh, the productivity progress were slowing down. In any case, it is also, the, in some way, it's a multidimensional problem, but the re responsible for the extraordinary low inflation and extraordinary accommodating uh, policies of central banks. So we, we, we have a, 
set of uh, characteristics of the functioning of our economy, which was really very adverse. And one of the positive or negative for the future is whether or not we get out of that. If we get out of that with more productivity progress, more growth, then we are on the positive side. And uh, we will have a post-COVID, uh, I would say, evolution of growth that would be much more flattering. The negative would be that, no, uh, we, it do, does not change. Uh, we are, and uh, there are eminent uh, uh, economists that are uh, claiming that uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. And then we would be in a very negative position because, because the, position, the, the 10 years since uh, Lehman Brothers are not sustainable in the very long run. That's absolutely clear. It's not sustainable. So uh, what is not sustainable will not be sustained and, and a, a new crisis will occur. Uh, central banks cannot be eternally extraordinarily accommodating. That's one, also one of the reasons I, well, I, I am a little bit prudent on the interest rates. I hear that we are tranquil and uh, the interest rates would be low for 10 years. Not sure. <laughs> there are, again, <laughs> positive scenario and negative scenario in this respect. And, uh, um, I, I don't think we should be too confident. In any case, of course, if inflation gallops, then uh, the uh, interest rates uh, will go up and up and nominally will go up. Not necessarily the real interest rates, but certainly the nominal interest rates. And markets are very sensitive to nominal interest rates, obviously, so at least uh, at the moment of the transition. So uh, I, I stop there. Uh, only to, to say, uh, to conclude my very short remarks, debt is a big question. It is not because there is no debt problem today in the eyes of the investors that you won't have debt problems tomorrow. I had known myself a moment where Greece had no problem to finance itself before Lehman and even after Lehman. Nine months after Lehman, Greece had no problem to finance itself. The market, we should never forget that, is totally binary. It, it's up or down. It's one or zero. And uh, uh, at the moment, the new government in Greece happened to be there and said the situation is graver. It was the start of a total catastrophe. And when you have one country or one entity that has problem, and that, uh, there we have the Chinese uh, entity in question. If you have a problem, then, then there is a contagion. Contagion is unavoidable. Human nature is probably behind. But, uh, but then we had Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy. And we had five countries that were tranquil uh, for a long period of time and were trapped in a sudden stop of financing. So. I exclude really nothing personally, and I think that uh, all entities, private and public, and all countries have to remain quite vigilant and not to lose the fact that they, their creditworthiness depends on the confidence of uh, investors and uh, savers uh, in their own country and the world over. So it's, it, it is very, very important. But I, sp I spoke too long. And uh, we still have a lot of time. So uh, who wants to take the floor? On Yeah. Do, do you want to, uh, Serge? Serge? So, Chairman, if you give me the floor, I will naturally take it. Thank you. Now, a number of things. Uh, first of all, um, yes, I agree with some of the remarks made by uh, Masood and um, uh, regarding the, uh, the, the, um, the question of the... Uh, 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 the concern about the uh, the, cr the uh, recovery, uh, I understand that. However, Sub-Sahara is diverse, as you know. Um, in our very region, I have to say that I'm I'm puzzled by the optimisms of the of the different ministers of finance. When I sit in the uh, in the Council of Ministers of Finance, I'm really puzzled by the energy, the willingness of doing things. When you look at you know uh, ministers like you know Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Senegal, they're very optimistic. You see, so there's there's energy that needs to be captured, and I have to say that you know it, it is um, it is it is amazing. All right, this is one. The second thing is you have mentioned this question of uh, SDR. 
the SDR allocation, it is, it is an interesting thing because if the SDR allocation are not subject to reforms, uh, they will be considered as helicopter money, you see, easy money. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it should be a give and take. Otherwise, you know, why should I reform my, my economy when, you know, at some point I'll get some money, free lunch, you see? So that's why I think it is a way through. It is a real way through. So that's why we need to see um, the strengths and how strong the hand of the different head of states from the G20, namely President Macron, uh, the chancellor, whoever the new chancellor would be, uh, and the new US administration. We need to see how strong the hand will be facing this situation. And I agree that the, the allocation in terms of quantum for Africa is way too low. No doubt about it, no doubt about it. Any other question of stability? Um, SDR, yes, fundamentally, yes. It is a, it is a true yes. And uh, prior, uh, uh, before joining the West African Development Bank, I can, I can tell you, I've, I was pitching, uh, I can give the name, I was pitching Total in London. And I was pitching them about their, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a green bond. They were thinking about it. That was three years ago. And I have to say that pitching total for a green bond, it is by itself something that needs to be considered, by itself. And we have the same discussion with BP, with Shell, etc. So by itself, by itself, it is, it is, a, it is, a, it is, a, it is a, a, a proof that something is happening and needs and things need, from that perspective, things needs to happen. So I agree with you fundamentally. I agree with you. Climate, EAG, and I agree also with you. Uh, Bertrand should should have should 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 have been with us. I think his uh, his expertise. Um, we are working with him at the, at the West African Development Bank, and I can tell you his expertise in that matter is really serious. Thank you. That is for me. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, Serge. Abdulaziz, I know that you have new rendezvous, but we would be very happy if you can give us your no, last you see, message. In the GCC here, I mean, there is a big, strong drive to also for employment for nationals, because in the UAE, in the banking sector, we have, you know, 30% of employees are national and the rest are expatriate. But I think uh, our government also should realize that moving forward with this, all this shift in consumer behavior, customer behavior, automation, digitization, I think in the next 10 years, 50% of our employment in the banking will disappear. So we, and that will also be applied to a lot other industries. So what are we going to do with the surplus of employee who's been, you know, good in their job, but the job is no longer is available? So, okay, yes, investment banker, maybe they are protected, you know, uh, but I think most of the retail banking, most of them, even commercial banking, automation is just and digitization is taken over. So I think that's an issue for our government also, and we have to prepare the people for a transition. And we, for that, we need growth. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Abdulaziz. We appreciate enormously your presence and your messages. And we will continue to meditate for a few minutes on the, this last message. Thank you very much indeed. Well, clear enough. Of course, digitalization means uh, a formidable transformation of our economies and on services. And uh, we, we have to to be fully aware of that, uh, um, and it's not only commercial bank, of course, it's, it's all the service industry, and you know, perhaps less, as, he, as Abdulaziz said, but, but perhaps less investment banks, but, 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 Madam, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chen, thank you very much for a very interesting intervention, interventions, and, and also the comments uh, made, and I fully agree with Mahmoud who said, has said that we have to really uh, think about the threats there are. Uh, it can be a very bumpy road. And uh, actually, after these uh, very good growth years, which we are experiencing now and next uh, uh, year, all the old problems and challenges are there. And that concerns especially 
the European Union. And a good question is, uh, when it comes to debt burdens, uh, uh, what will happen in Italy? Will Super Mario, uh, is he able to, to make it uh, or, or not? And, and that is not only uh, the case uh, of Italy. I think many countries, also my country, Finland, struggle with low productivity. And the COVID crisis has been a very uh, good excuse not to implement those structural reforms which are needed. Uh, so, and now with the new chancellor, uh, probably <laughs> uh, from a new uh, party, SPD, uh, from uh, Olaf Scholz, is uh, very um, kind of obvious that between him and uh, President Macron, uh, there will be some changes, maybe ch not changes in the uh, growth and stability pact, but um, at least uh, uh, in ways how we interpret it. Uh, so there are kind of many question marks also in, in, in Europe, and uh, especially when it comes to uh, implementing uh, those structural reforms which are needed in, in most of the countries. Uh, is there enough uh, willingness really to do, do that or not? Very good remark, obviously. And uh, what strikes me uh, as regards Europe is that uh, uh, we are more or less communicating as if there was a single recommendation for all countries, a single motto, if I may. And of course, there is a single monetary policy. But the, the recommendation for each particular country should be very different because Finland is not Germany and Germany is not Italy and uh, Italy is not the Netherlands. For, for instance, for me, it's very clear, Germany is in a situation of enormous amount of uh, current account surplus, very good fiscal position before COVID and has uh, room for maneuvering and should utilize some room for maneuvering for the sake of Germany and for the sake of the system as a whole. Uh, Italy and France, for instance, uh, have you know, to be cautious and prudent, in my opinion. And it's not at all the recommendation that uh, we would give to Germany. And Finland has its own problem. <laughs> and, uh, and, I mean, structural reform, by the way, are of the essence for all European countries, it seems to me, at least all those who are not at uh, full employment, and it's the case of Finland, if, I, if I'm not misled. It's the case, of, of course, uh, of a number of other countries. And uh, the first goal should be to arrive through structural reforms and good management to full employment. But that's another story. Uh, we have another. Yeah, please, madam. Um, thank you. Um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in finance or monetary, but I would like to build on some of the questions and some of the things that were mentioned in here. Uh, build back better, you know, and build. And, and I look at it from the perspective of livelihoods and people's kind of, you know, um, uh, dignified way of living. And of course, we talked about inflation, and my colleague Dania mentioned how much as well it will impact people's livelihoods. There are you know, high level monetary policies, decisions that could be taken, are the depth as well, you know, levels and how the high they are. And of course, we heard the example of Lebanon, which is striking about how much all of the policies or maybe gaps in policies where it led. So what I would like to ask here is, given your experience, is how people in a participatory way could engage in accountability measures towards, for example, central banks and others. Of course, there is the regulatory frameworks, there is, of course, the systems and, you know, all of that. But what kind of, you know, um, engagement or role uh, could be taken to, to monitor such policies, but also to ensure that they are linked to social protections policies that helps people. So in a way, mechanism of accountability for decisions that could harm people's lives. Thank you for, for uh, your question. I stand ready to respond to your question, but we are at the end and I wanted to, to be sharp uh, in uh, the 
close of our uh, very, very stimulating meeting. So I, what I would do at this stage, perhaps, is to, to give the, the, the floor to Jean-Claude, to Jacques, and to Serge again, and, uh, if, he, if he wishes, uh, for the last word. I, and I would say a few words myself and respond to your question. So, Jean-Claude, what would you say uh, to comment on the very, very stimulating no, uh, questions and observations? Uh, I was, as you said, today very optimistic, and you, all of you, uh, have shown the risks. And I must say that I share your views about the risks. That's all. <laughs> No, you said you said that uh, we had to remain vigilant. If I'm not misled, so so you accept that there are risks. But but yeah, we have to, to remain. Extremely, the main message was careful, and uh, uh, of course, this pandemic crisis has created an enormous inequality among the countries, among the countries, among the people uh, who were in bad conditions and poor, and who are poor today. Uh, even though there has been social measures by the governments and among the world between the rich countries and poor countries. And indeed, the growth of uh, uh, countries which are poor is a problem and uh, is, a, is getting to be a real problem and we should help to finance these problems. I must say, at the same time, I remain optimistic for one reason about the debt. I remember three or four years ago, we were, all, all, all of us were concerned by the debt. Today, we talk about the debt, but at the same time, the debt is managed extremely well thanks to the low interest rates and to all the inflows of money uh, that we, we, we have. So, in life, I think we have to remain optimistic uh, in a nutshell, because if we are not, then we are depressed, <laughs> which is another cliche. Okay, this is a, a nice way of uh, concluding your remark. Uh, Jean, uh, Jacques. Yes, so as far as I'm concerned, maybe uh, it's by uh, profession, I'm more inclined to be cautious and uh, to be pessimistic. We didn't speak about the unwinding uh, of all these uh, stimulus packages. Uh, interest rate holidays, uh, loan deferrals, and so forth. So when this program came come to an end, um, we might have also socially and economically some negative impact. So uh, I think uh, we shouldn't underestimate also uh, the consequences of the phase out of this uh, stimuli uh, and the uh, support packages. Um, in, it's a pity indeed that uh, our colleague, uh, our expert uh, uh, for energy transition is not with us. It's true that um, for banks today it's extremely difficult to navigate because the framework are not, have not been stabilized yet. Taxonomy are not yet finalized. Um, we have to avoid by all means uh, greenwashing. And, um, and also what we understand, what is under preparation is more, uh, in terms of taxonomy, is more um, to the attention of investors, asset measures, and um, it gives definition and picture at a certain time. But what we would appreciate as lenders, as bankers, is to accompany the transition, to accompany the energy transition of uh, our counterparts, not to take a picture at a certain time, what is green, what is not green, and, uh, and notably for these uh, sensitive industries, what is important is uh, the progress uh, made, the roadmap design, uh, to uh, all the iteration uh, towards energy transition. So it's very complex today. Uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, for, and um, difficult, uh, a lot of communication uh, and we have to be very, Serge mentioned that uh, when you pitch for Total uh, is not obvious uh, or BP and so forth. Um, these uh, measures or national oil producers at the moment are working very hard to design uh, a, a very serious, rigorous uh, ESG framework. Um, but uh, we are in need of uh, regulations and clarification 
uh, for this uh, green uh, green financing. Thank you very much, uh, Jacques, indeed. And uh, I, I understand pretty well that, for, seen from your own standpoint, uh, the challenges are enormous. Uh, what would you say, Serge? One last word, uh, Mr. President. Two lessons learned from our past experience and from the uh, from the um, uh, from the last crisis. The first one was that the um, the financial system was could be could have been better regulated. I think you remember that that period. And the second one was one of the second one was um, the uh, financial institution back then were undercapitalized. And it, w when you look at things today, that's no longer the case. And this has been very a powerful shield in this crisis, with an exception, emerging countries, emerging countries. So I believe that based on this experience, we should extend this to the emerging country world, where when you look at things in details, institutions are way, way, way too undercapitalized. So to face the situation, the new situation, which is more commitment for the people, more commitment for the population, sustainability, sustainable growth, we need financial institutions that are way, way, way better capitalized. That's my motto. I think you have all understood that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank Chairman. you very, very much indeed, Serge. So uh, <clears throat> my own last word, because uh, we, we address so, so many issues, uh, only to mention the fact that uh, it's true that uh, market economies and the entire world proved resilience, and uh, that perhaps gives some, <laughs> some uh, flesh to uh, the idea that we can remain relatively confident. Uh, we had the... Uh, I, I was myself president of the Paris Club when we had to reschedule Latin America, Africa, Soviet Union and so forth. And we went through that terrible experience. We had the dot-com bubble explosion. We had uh, Lehman Brothers. Uh, we had the Euro crisis. Uh, we, had, uh, we have COVID. And uh, we found out pragmatically uh, the way of uh, coping with this situation. Uh, some were thinking that the Euro area would totally collapse and be blown up. Uh, I was convinced uh, that it was plain wrong. Uh, by the way, after Lehman Brothers, four new countries get, got in the euro area, four new countries, and no countries left. So those in, uh, say, on the other side of the Atlantic that were absolutely sure that everything will be blown up were wrong, obviously. And, uh, of course, we are wrong because there, there was uh, appropriate decisions taken, appropriate, uh, uh, I would say, way of coping with a very grave situation. So there, there is resilience. But, of course, uh, we have to know that there is no time for absence of vigilance. Everything can happen any time, and uh, we have to be prepared for uh, the unexpected. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that we have been quite exhaustive in listing the risks today, but we will have new events or risks tomorrow. We were not mentioning at all geostrategy, which is nevertheless one very important uh, uh, meditation in this colloquium. And of course, uh, we could have dramatic events that would totally uh, uh, change our perspective. Now, uh, I respond to your, to your question. Uh, the... Uh, central banks are independent, which does not mean that they are not responsible. And all central banks, to my knowledge, are very often uh, in uh, uh, contact with the parliaments, the representative of the people. It's true in the euro system because each national central bank has to make report on the uh, uh, national central banks and the president of the uh, ECB goes at least six times a year uh, in front of the European Parliament, uh, different commissions and the plenary session, which is quite impressive, I have to say. The plenary session in the, in the European Parliament, <laughs> you have the feeling that it is science fiction because there are so many, so many MPs. So uh, th that, that's one. Second, the treaty itself uh, of course, calls for uh, the central bank 
to deliver price stability, at least the Maastricht Treaty, and to support the policies of the European Union when price stability is ensured, uh, without prejudice to price stability, etc. So <clears throat> that makes also the central bank, and uh, it, it has been the case, uh, I have to say constantly, to have this addition of responsibilities. Now, you, the central bank is responsible before the people. And uh, the most grateful, uh, I would say, observation I can make is that when at the beginning of the euro, a lot of people were extremely skeptical and convinced that it would be a failure, convinced that it was impossible to think that it could be a credible currency and so forth. At the moment I'm speaking, in the last survey, 75% of the people that are in the euro area approve the euro. 75. More than 80% in Germany. More than 70% in France, to my, in my memory. So, in a way, the central bank proved that it could inspire the confidence of the general public, I mean, uh, of, the, of the men and women in the street. And uh, that, that, of course, is very interesting. Now, we are living in democracies. New questions are coming permanently, and that's absolutely right. And uh, central banks have to reflect on whether some of their instruments are not creating inequalities, whether it's right uh, to embark on uh, <coughs> asset purchases uh, in, w when you have no more, uh, I would say, interest rates uh, uh, possibilities. It's been the case in all major central banks. I consider that the question is perfectly uh, right. Uh, I also consider, of course, that uh, had they let uh, deflation to materialize, then the general public would have been in a dramatic situation and we would have had, you know, something which could have been worse than in 2930s of the last century. So. All what you do has, uh, you know, good and bad consequences. You have to balance that and be sure that you take the right decision. But at the last resort, in an independent central bank, it seems to me that you are responsible in front of the public at large. That's, that would be my last word, and it is, uh, it is two minutes after time. So thank you very, very much indeed for uh, active and vivid participation. Thank you.